All right, hello. Hello, how is everybody? Good, good, thank you for coming. If you've never been a student of mine before, we haven't been class together. My name is Tom. Um, I teach the Advanced Interactive Audio course along with Chris, who's over here. And uh, luckily today, we have an RA grad, Joshua, who's going to basically talk to us about game sound. And what he's going to do is do his presentation and kind of talk to you and then do a Q&A session afterwards. Um, uh, and uh, out of curiosity, how many people here are recording arts students by show of hands? Oh. And how many people are game design students? Okay. Well, we've got a game design student too, awesome. And anything else, film? Any film students? We've got some film students, awesome. What else would I think of? Graphic design? <laughs> Digital arts? <laughs> no? All right, so we've gone through the rest. Um, well, thanks for coming, and let me introduce to you uh, Joshua Davidson, and he can tell you about yourself, about himself. Yeah.
uh, to come here and take recording arts back in 2006. So this is actually a picture of me during the behind the scenes tour here, being a poser. Um, <laughs> uh, this, uh, my career goal and upon enrollment was to become a recording engineer and producer. I really love being behind the board, tweaking things. I love making really cool sounds and, and something that sounds really fat and punchy, fat beats and things like that. Um, so, I know fat beats is kind of like an inside joke here, so. <laughs> Good. So being behind the board, making something sound polished and professional was kind of the main thing that I wanted to, to accomplish. And whether or not you like my music composition or not, I just at least wanted people to be like, well, you know, it kind of sounds commercially acceptable, like quality wise. <laughs> So that was the main thing that I wanted people to at least, you know, give me props for, even though I was horrible, uh, horrible at it back then and all that. So um, I always envisioned my life graduated sitting in front of these like big, beautiful boards that look like star destroyers. And when you come to the behind the scenes tour here, you're like, oh gosh, who wouldn't want to just sit in front of this all day and move all these faders? And uh, it, it would just make me so happy, you know. Uh, and that's where it lures a lot of people here. It's like, oh man, I want to be a creative professional. I want to work on music, and I want to put a package together, and I want it to go around the world, and I want people to hear my product, and I want it to uh, add value to the lives of hopefully millions of people if I become very successful. So that's what kind of lured me in here, and I'm sure it, it made a lot of you want to come here too. But you know, I began to ask myself, reality began to settle in, and I began to ask, what am I up against here? What kind of world would I be stepping into to get that career? And I began to ask myself, you know, was it really for me? Did I really want to do that? So I learned that the competition was thick. Uh, thick, thick. Um, there were 2,000 uh, recording artists graduates a year from wholesale. Uh, most wanted to work as recording engineers in Wholesale. So a lot of people, and a lot of them were very talented, a lot of my classmates were very talented people, all wanting to do the same thing. And I believe that I had the ability to do such a job well. But uh, I just kind of began thinking, wow, this is, this is, am I in over my head here? What did I sign up for? And big studios all over the world are closing their doors. And computers now are, are revolutionizing the way we record. So the technology is changing. And we're starting to move recording technology inside of people's houses now. So you don't really have the typical brick and mortar studios that you normally used to have that like you know, back in the day, in the 70s, when all those awesome people were there. So inside of people's homes now. And recording engineer jobs are mostly freelance now. So studio staffing is becoming more and more of a rare gig to find. So it's frustrating to have big dreams in an industry with diminished opportunity. That's totally invisible. That's me being frustrated. Okay, guys. Uh, but don't get me wrong, I love that I was able to learn the audio software before coming to school. And that same technology that was giving me a leg up before coming here was also changing the way recording engineer jobs work, and it still is. But, but, in 2006, new audio innovations were happening in a completely different industry. And these smaller scale pieces of technology that were moving into people's homes and uh, changing the way that the recording industry works, uh, they, they were, uh, they were bit, this industry that was embracing the inexpensive and powerful audio tools that I, I have you know, come to know and love. And you might be able to guess what industry I'm talking about here. So new consoles were out on the market, and they were featuring more robust and state-of-the-art audio engines. And as a result, game audio jobs were becoming more in demand. And that sounds pretty exciting, but what does it exactly mean? What is a game audio job? What do you do when you get into a game audio studio uh, or a game studio and start working in audio? Nobody really kind of knew around me, so I began to plunder and try to find out what that was all about. So at the time, it was really hard for me to find out what a game audio job entailed. It was pretty new. I'm getting into it here, um, and um, most people seem to know that. The budgets for games are getting higher, and the sound design quality is getting a lot higher. And also, we were getting these new audio engines that were running in games that were creating more dynamic mix environments for sound in games. So, you know, some examples of that would be Battlefield, Bad Company, and they basically created um, 
they have what's known as the frostbite engine. We were just actually talking about that just a second ago in the video. Uh, but they, um, they have the frostbite engine, and it's this very advanced, dynamic uh, audio system that can prioritize sounds very efficiently and basically show you where the more important sounds are. So if an explosion occurs next to your head, you need to hear that explosion more than any other sound in the game, right? So it will duck out other sounds, and you'll be able to hear that one just clear as day. So you combine the Frostbite engine, that, this really dynamic and, and robust audio engine, and you combine it with really awesome content, and you have a really kick-ass sounding game. Uh, and Battlefield Bat Company 3 just came out recently, and if you play it, most people will, will you know, argue this is one of the best sounding games that's ever been made. Just flat out. People will just go, it feels like there, you know? So when I was in school, God of War was the one that most people seemed to talk about. Like, God of War, God of War, God of War. Uh, uh, the reason for that is it had one of the highest audio budgets of all time at the time, and I think still to this day, it rivals a lot of audio budgets. And the reason for that is mainly, well, music. The music is fantastic. It was professionally written, and they recorded live orchestras, and it has really dynamic and interesting themes, and it still holds up today. I mean, not a lot of games, you know, with great audio hold up today, but, you know, um, God of War is one of them. And if you listen to it today, you'll be like still impressed by it. So um, it's another good example of where game audio is going. Halo 3. Halo 3 is a great example of what this console generation is doing. We have an L1 maximizer, I think. It's the L1, right? Yeah. Running in the background of the game all the time. So think of it as almost like you're playing through a DAW session and like all the all the sounds just hitting this meter and leveling out all the sounds so it doesn't you know, reach a certain uh, peak volume. And as a result, I imagine that they reduce the threshold a little bit so that you can have all the sounds kind of mesh together a little bit more. So it's almost like mini mastering session occurring live while you're playing, but not really, you know, it's just using these plugins that we've all started to learn and love, like the Waves Bundle, um, uh, uh, actually running live now while you're playing the game, whether you know it or not, it's actually happening, which is pretty fascinating. So I had to find out more, and I went online. And in 2006 and 2007, MySpace, believe it or not, people use MySpace, it was the dominating social network. It, it had a highly useful search tool that, was, that allowed people to search for people based on their profession. So what I mean by that is that it was actually very granular. So I could search for someone in the film industry, and I can, I can narrow down that search. I could say film music, and uh, uh, what are you, like a reportist, or I could go, uh, you know, uh, video games, music, sound, and basically find a wide variety of people that were working in the industry, and they all had public profiles, you know, because MySpace actually was, you know, more, it was more socially acceptable for some reason to have uh, public profiles back then, so I was able to find all these people that just had these jobs that I wanted to know more about. And I did what I thought would be the right thing to do, and that was, you know, talk to people and send them messages. And to my surprise, I found, you know, I found that game audio professionals all over the world were happy to answer my questions and, and give me feedback and encourage me along the way while I was trying to find out more about what they did. And most of them, you know, are so enthusiastic to talk about their jobs. It's amazing. And, you know, I thought that they were like these kind of like godlike creatures that were, you know, <laughs> looking over me and didn't want to talk to me. But no, they're cool. They're all like, you know, whatever, man. <laughs> ask me any question, I'll be happy to, you know, answer. And that's fantastic. I mean, what more could you ask for as a student? So, in the coming months, after emailing dozens of professionals, I learned a lot of cool stuff about the industry. And I'm about to give you the next few slides here are a bunch of bullet points that basically are going to cover the quality of life aspects of working in the industry. And um, so there's going to be mostly good and a couple of bad things. <laughs> uh, but we're going to start off with just the good stuff. So starting salaries for junior sound designers can range from $30,000 to $45,000 a year. And salaries for senior sound designers, which you know, are, are after about four to five years or more experience, 
they can range from about sixty thousand to over a hundred thousand dollars a year. You can actually end up getting a six-figure salary income from these these gigs, depending on the studio, depending on the location. There's a lot of factors that play into what your salary is going to be. And uh, full-time employment at many of these developers have health and dental benefits, 401k, you get paid vacations, bonuses, ridiculous amounts of soda and junk food, <laughs> and you know at least you get the health and dental benefits to fight off all the cancer you're going to get from eating all that. <laughs> other perks include discounted membership to uh, local or internal gyms. Uh, once again, to put the junk food. Um, so that's really cool. There's two other perks that I didn't list on here because they're because they're a little more rare. And um, one of those is um, at Gearbox, for example, we have uh, I did mention bonuses, but we have a profit sharing program. So if the game does well, we see we see profit from that. And that's like you know, if you're a, a recording artist, you get royalties. That's kind of the same way it works uh, at Gearbox, and it works that way at a few other studios. But I didn't list it there. Uh, listed on the slide because it's different. It's so so different in every studio, and um, and uh, yeah, so really cool benefits here. Um, oh, and another thing, I, I knew I had another one. Uh, no core hours. So what I mean by that is um, you can just kind of get out of bed and go to work whenever you want, and you can you know you can. But there's there's political repercussions for coming in at like four, so <laughs> so don't do that if you get in the industry. Like if you feel really tired one day and you want to sleep an extra hour, go for it. But um, you know that's what I do pretty much. But if you come in at four or something, you you're working on games. Games are a collaborative process, and you need to be able to communicate with people on your team and talk with them. And people are gonna want to ask you questions during the day, and if you're not there, then people are gonna be like, well, that guy he doesn't care. And that's really what happens here. So here's one thing that I really loved about uh, about learning about game audio and no coding experience is required. And that was kind of the, the conventional wisdom, the misconception that most people had is that is that you had to learn code to work in, in games no matter what you did. That's not true. You don't have to learn any code. Not one bit. I don't know any code at all. <laughs> and middleware is basically software that is designed by sound professionals and coders alike. And what middleware does, think of about think about middleware as a DAW for your game. Um, and if you don't know what DAW is, it's digital audio workstation. So a DAW for your game that you can export content out of your real DAW and import it into this middleware, and you'll be able to actually control values that will affect how the sound is in the game. So it's like graphic user interface that prevents you from having to know any code. So it serves as a tool to get that sound design work functioning properly in the game. And two examples here are FMOD, which is right here. FMOD is free. You can go online, download it, look up YouTube tutorial videos on it. You'll find tons of great stuff on FMOD. And, um, and really, uh, in all honesty, the big one to learn now, because FMOD is kind of going the way of the dinosaur, is WISE. WISE is a lot more advanced, and it can do so much more stuff. And um, there's several more tools that you can that, that you can learn uh, that are actually inside the program itself. And, um, and it's just a lot more of a robust system. Plus, more games are like starting to take to it. So you know, uh, when I was leaving Collision. We actually started adopting WIs, and when I got the job at Gearbox, we were taking out of mod and you know, uh, adopting WIs as well. So WIs is actually running in the background of a lot of popular games right now. Assassin's Creed uses it, Warland uses it now, and uh, we're using it on all of our projects. So we need it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great, it's really awesome. So the intrinsic award to me about working on games is that it's a new and exciting industry. And you're talking about an industry that's really just barely over 20 years old. That's really gotten off the ground here. And working on, and it's a it's a fresh medium, and we've only really begun to just unravel the possibilities here. Um, the art that you create, and I'm going to use the word art. That's a very controversial word in, in video games, but it has a chance to reach a global audience. So the same reason that you came to school here to maybe work on music or whatever, it, it's you're still accomplishing the same goal here. You're you're 
getting your 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 art out there, and it can be used to inform and entertain and and mold the add value to the lives of potentially millions of people all across the world. So pretty awesome. I thought all this stuff was great. Um, not only uh, are these other perks around, but uh, here are two uh, interior shots of uh, two different studios. This is High Moon Studios. It's in San Diego, California. Um, they have a really interesting kind of techie layout environment. This is, uh, the, oh yeah, they're also responsible for, um, what games are they responsible for? Oh, Transformers and Born Games. So they do some movie licensing uh, games. Radical Entertainment, they're located in Vancouver, and they work on a game called uh, Prototype. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah. 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 So this is the entire in interior of their break room. So check this out. They have a log cabin inside their break room. That's awesome. That's pretty good. A log, just marinate on that for a little while. A log <laughs> cabin inside the break room. Those people are very happy because they have that. Another Vancouver studio, EA Sports, has an internal basketball gym, and they also have a, a soccer field, um, which is pretty crazy. Uh, I didn't know game developers went outside. <laughs> <laughs> this is the interior of our lobby at your box. Uh, so this is actually an extremely deceptive shot. It is, it is the smallest room in the world. Uh, it looks gigantic here, but thanks to panoramic technology and wide-angle lenses, we have this. But um, still, very cool. We have all our awards right here. We have all the characters you can choose from Borderlands right here. A real life-size uh, claptrap, which is, a, which is a robot from the game, and uh, you know, it's just cool. It's a cool, welcoming environment to come to every day. Uh, back to High Moon and Radical. High Moon, look, it looks just like a post-production facility that you would work at. And just in a, you know, in a film. And same thing with Radical. These are the guys that, once again, the log cabin. Uh, they have a wood floor and, you know, a 5-1 mixing suite that's designed to mix cutscenes in. So it's like games are adopting these same, uh, these same practices that film are and, and, and music are. And, you know, that looks cool. So they have the log cabin and the wood floors and the couch. <laughs> This is actually my office right now. Um, I work, uh, this is just kind of like where I sit all day and, and all that stuff. So I have a DG003 right here. I'm running some Genelite speakers and uh, I, I use an Access Virus T2i synthesizer to do a lot of sound design. Borderlands is a very sci-fi heavy game, so doing a lot of really sci-fi tweaky sounds is a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, I run a Mac and a PC, so I do all my sounds on a Mac and then export them over to my PC, where I dump them into WYs and implement them into the game. So that's just kind of like the basic workflow. So here's the negative thing that I was telling you about earlier. I told you that something was going to be bad. And that's crunch hours. Crunch hours are, are the kind of negative thing about the industry as, uh, you know, industry-wide that people talk about. And it varies from studio to studio. And not every studio you know, has the same crunch practices, but some can be really bad, ranging from 70 to 80 hours a week for you know, weeks or months, or I've even heard about it happening for a year on certain projects. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Hey, Josh, I just wanted to mention uh, my, my original background was in music production and studios, and 70 to 80 hours a week is mm -hmm. a, a light week in mm -hmm. pop music production. So right. it's called crunch in games, and right. just as a side note. Yeah, so if you think you're gonna not do that in another industry, it's not true. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, ramping up your hours during pivotal points of a development are almost unavoidable. And some studios are way better at it than others, and some, you know, some are just horrible. Like, they can't make decisions, management is horrible. Their scope for the game is too large and they can't cut certain features. So, you know, it's going to be different everywhere. But it seems like, you know, slowly developers are catching on that there's no way to make a great game, really. I mean, you, if your employees are suffering, then there's a point of diminishing return. You're going to start making more errors. I know I make more errors after I work a certain amount of hours and I start making stupid mistakes and I start daydreaming more. And, you know, it's just the reality of the human condition. People just, do that because we, you know, that's why the 40-hour work week was created. 
is because, well, we figured out that humans work best that way. So it's no way to sustain happy employees, and people are starting to realize that. So more and more, you're not going to see as many crunch hours, and I personally haven't crunched so hard that it's diminished my quality of life to, to something horrible or anything. And like, like I said, L.A. Noir had one of the worst crunches I've ever even heard about. And it was basically ran by this guy, this like uh, tyrannical dictator-like CEO who, who, who uh, basically didn't even put certain people on the credits because he didn't think that they worked uh, worked certain amount of hours enough. So that's kind of ridiculous. Wow. If you go, yes, well, I didn't know. Say, I was gonna say, in one point of notice is not only was this blown out into the public sector through a lot of reports from major websites in the industry, it was mainly industry news websites, but Team Bondi closed down shortly afterwards after the game came out. And even after the game was a huge success from the looks of it, but because of the developmental turmoils, loss leader, some being in crunch for I think three to four years was about how long they were in crunch mode. It was more. really horrible. And like it, there were there were just these really horrible like political scenarios oh, that were in place where like, oh you didn't come in on Sunday and work for twelve hours? You're a horrible person, you know? Like that's what the, how the mentality got there. It got so bad. And that's rare. That I promise you that's rare. And I haven't worked so hard that I that I felt that way. I, I think the longest week that I've worked is maybe seventy five hours. And that was one week during Saints Row Two development. So nothing too bad. Red Dead Redemption, another bad example. And I hate to keep giving bad examples here, but uh, I just want to make sure everyone's aware. But um, Red Dead Redemption had a crunch where the wives of the developers actually all signed a huge letter and said, we don't see our husbands anymore. Please give us our husbands back. <laughs> so that's how, so whenever you play Red Dead Redemption, think of the wives. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great game, too. Yeah. But despite hearing about crunch time from all these industry professionals, it didn't really phase me. And you know what? They were telling me it didn't really hurt their quality of life. Most of, most of the people were telling me that they worked pretty steady hours and nothing got too crazy. And they loved what they did. So their lives weren't affected negatively. So that's perfect. It was like I discovered the secrets of the universe. <laughs> figured out about VM audio because and the reason I feel this way is it is because oh, that's Morgan Freeman by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I felt that way uh, was because I saw so many people wanting to get into recording and nobody knew anything about game audio. And I was like, oh my god, everyone look. So that's how I felt. <laughs> that's Morgan Freeman. So I stayed open to any audio career possibilities that could potentially come my way, but I decided game audio was going to be the career choice for me. And what I mean by staying open is, if you get a music job or if you get a post-production job, it's definitely a great idea to take it. The, the skill sets that you learn in one industry from another, you'll be able to apply to game audio, you know, and vice versa. I mean, it's a very practical decision to take a job just doing audio. So you can just skip into another industry and it'll be a very smooth, a lot smoother transition for you. So while I was a student here, not many of the staff were really too familiar about game audio. And that's not to really belittle any of the knowledge of the staff here. <laughs> <laughs> but that, the reason for that is because it was such a new and fresh field. And this school is mainly designed to be music production and post-production. And the staff here are very knowledgeable about those sort of things. So the main thing that people told me was that there was a great place for an online game audio community, and it was called Game. Uh, it's called Game Audio Network Guild. So for 50 bucks, you can join, and I joined in December of 2006. And it's basically a forum where you can talk to a lot of different professionals. You can talk to other students. You can really research new technologies that are coming forth in the industry. And it's just a whole bunch of information. But uh, to be honest, I wasn't too crazy about it. Uh, when I first joined, I only made one post to the forum. And uh, it was about us, me being a student seeking advice. This one post, however, probably really helped change my life forever. Because I met another Full Sail reporting artist grad named Mark Kilborn. You all know Mark? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark uh, was working at a place called Bizarre Creations at the time. 
And Bazaar, uh, they're responsible for, or they were responsible, they shut down last year. They were responsible for Project Gotham and another game called The Club and Geometry Wars. If you've ever played Geometry Wars, it's fantastic. And Blur, right? Blur? Yeah, they did Bazaar. They yeah, Bazaar. Awesome game. I don't know why it didn't do well. It's an awesome game. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's fantastic. So pick that up. It's on iPad and stuff too. Um, so Mark actually kind of was really nice, and he was like, hey, I'm a full cell grad too. You want to get into game, game audio? Well, I'm going to give you all the advice that you could ever ask for. And that was really nice for him, right? Nice that he would do that. After he worked at Bazaar, he switched over to work at Gearbox in Dallas, which is where I work now. And in the coming months, he would just basically be my online mentor for game audio. And I would ping him, and he would ping me, you know, and just be like, hey, how are you doing? You know, like, what's your day like today? And he would tell me about what sort of tasks he was working on, from ambience to creature sounds to things like that. He couldn't tell me specific details because if he did, he'd be breaking his uh, non-disclosure agreement about not telling trade secrets. But he was able to tell me a lot about what was going on uh, in his technical life and his day-to-day -day, uh, life. So during those months, he would also send me these potential job opportunities for small <coughs> indie games. And one of these games, the only one I can remember was, it was a Panzer General game, it was like a little tank game. And I applied to every single one, but I never heard back from anyone. And it was beginning to become very frustrating that like, I can't even get these small little bitty games to even look at me. What's, you know, it felt very, very disheartening. Like how, how can I get a big guy, big AAA developer to hire me if these guys won't even give me a shot? So, you know, if you ever get in that position, just think think of what happened to me here. Um, but you know what? On a rainy day in May, after my final recording, I was very frustrated on this day. It was everything was getting very stressful for me at this time. I only had one month left to go in school, and I wanted to get a job right out of school so bad. It was like my main thing. I just had to get a job. I don't want to because my other option was just going home and living with my parents again, and I didn't want to do that. So Mark sent me a listing for a AAA game developer located in Champaign, Illinois, and that was Volition. And they work on Saints Row and Saints Row 2, and they just came out with Saints Row the Third. I don't know if you played it, it's you're crazy. But the listing was for a junior sound designer and it required no previous experience. None. It happens every now and then. I know it's kind of weird. Uh, but it did happen, and it's, it does, I've seen it happen a couple times since. But um, the reason that they were doing this is because they used to have a senior level person there. And they, the senior level person left, and they were like, well, what we could do is that we could just, instead of just hiring another senior person, we could actually just hire two juniors and then just kind of give them on-the-job training. And we have to see that these people have potential, so we can give them that on-the-job training. So, I saw this listing and thought that this was way too good to be true. I, you know, it didn't even say junior, it just said sound design. And I was like, just read it over and over again. I'm like, where it doesn't say no experience mm -hmm. or any experience required. Because these small indie games that I was applying for were requiring experience. So what was up with this? I have no <laughs> idea. I still don't really understand. But I sent in my resume and my website portfolio and it only concluded samples of music composition. I had never even touched sound design before, and I was waiting until my post-production class was done in order to, you know, do it. So I went to the Volition website and applied uh, through their THQ uh, application, which they're a subsidiary of uh, uh, THQ. And I found that the lead sound designer was actually listed on the website. He was actually an audio supervisor, but whatever. Um, and his name was Dan Wentz. And if you actually go to these developer websites, there's actually a huge staff section where you can actually research the people that work, work there. So I found the highest ranking person I could and decided this is actually the best tip that Mark ever gave me. And I think this is the best tip anybody can ever give you. It's if you do find a, a, an opportunity like this, go to their website, look through the staff, and find the highest ranking sound person you can. And this is how game industry email addresses work. It's either going to be their first initial and last name or vice versa. So you can just send out a few emails that you think are their email and be like, hey, I like your, your job and, and you know, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to working with your team if possible and I'm very passionate about game audio and everything like this. And just shoot, shoot it out there and, and see what happens. 
And in five minutes, I got an email back. Five minutes, just by doing that. And I hadn't done that for my little small indie developer friends who didn't ever look at me. So this was probably a key component to getting noticed. Dan Wentz was their, uh, like I said, their Volition's audio supervisor, and he liked my website portfolio. He told me that composition was a plus, but he needed to see me do some sound design. And like I said, I had no experience with that, and I only had like a handful of totally legally obtained sound libraries on my computer, <laughs> and that's it. So I decided I would just, you know, without any hesitation, I jumped on that opportunity. And I said, of course I'll do that, you know? It was Friday, and I spent the weekend making demos for them. So when a AAA game developer asks you to do something, you have to do it. Because this may be your only you know, chance to do this for a long time. So the best way to make a sound design demo reel without having any experience is to basically go to GameTrailers.com or find gameplay footage from somewhere and take that gameplay footage from a quick time and drop it into your DAW session. Rip out all the audio and just start replacing it with your own. Don't include any music, just do sound design. And make sure that you make it sound just like it would happen as if it were occurring in a game. So the two demos that I chose were a Volition title, Saints Row. And I decided to keep it in the same kind of genre bar ballpark that the studio typically works in and do Bioshock. Since they do some sci-fi games, I decided to kind of keep it you know, in their same genre. So I spent the whole weekend toiling away at these two demos and combining library sound effects, synthesis, and voiceover recording. And the voiceover recording was just myself. And they're not looking for you to be an amazing voice actor, so don't even worry about that. Just get your voice in there and just make it have you know, the feedback you're looking for. And both reels were only 45 seconds long. I spent about a day and a half on the Bioshock one, and I spent Sunday just working on the same show one. The Bioshock one was a little more detailed, so it required a little more love. Um, so on Monday, I submitted the two reels to Dan and began clicking the refresh button on my Gmail account kind of like this, just over and over and over and over. And after a few months, moments, Dan got back to me. He said he liked my work and I set up a phone interview. So that happened really quickly. And after talking to the team a few days after submitting the demos, they gave me the infamous line, well, we'll keep in touch, you know. So whenever I got on the phone with them, I basically just tried to act like I knew what I was talking about. I really didn't really know much about game audio at the time, but I had done enough research to be able to kind of speak the language, so to speak. And Full Cell actually helped me improve my workflow when I was here, so I was able to actually articulate my points better, and, uh, and I, I was definitely very nervous when I was talking on the phone, and I, I'm sure that they could hear my voice just a <laughs> minute. And uh, so, yeah, they said, we'll keep in touch. And a week went by with no communication, and... I refreshed my email inbox continuously while I was home, and this is like, I just wanted to tell you guys this, because if you're ever in the situation, like, just think, like, it's not so bad. You may just be having to wait a little bit longer, because these processes actually take a long time. So I was beginning to lose hope. And I actually talked to my career development advisor at the time, and I was like, uh, they haven't gotten back to me in a week, and she was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but she was very encouraging, and she was like, well, you know, just wait. And she actually was helping me out with some other opportunities as well. But I was beginning to lose hope. But after eight days of waiting, I received an email from their HR, and they were saying, hey, we'd love to fly you out for an on-site interview. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a long time <laughs> short. <laughs> I flew out and tried to act like I knew what I was talking about again to the Blizzard team, and I got a job offer a few days later. So that's just kind of like the process it took me to get from point A to point B. And I hope that that information kind of, did that help anybody out? Like, yeah. like and, and understanding of what some of the bullet points were. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about what day-to-day -day life is like in the industry. Like what do you do when you come in? What are some of the tasks that you're assigned, assigned with? Like, so I was given the opportunity to do so many different things. And it was actually surprising how much creative control I was given right off the bat. Um, the first month, I actually spent most of my time creating sound effects or visual effects, which include everything from explosions to water fountains. And each sound set requires about four variations. Uh, that was a volition standardization for, uh, for these. 
to, to avoid repetition. So if, a sound, so if an explosion occurs next to your head, you don't want to hear that same one sound over and again. If it occurs four times next to you, you need to hear a different sound every single time. So it just needs to be a little bit different, but uh, all the same sound. So we can attach these sounds to like an explosion effect, for example. And whenever that explosion effect occurs in the game, you hear something different each time. And I was also required to set distance-based attenuations for each effect and adjust the mix on that. And if you don't know what a distance-based attenuation is, it's a numerical value that you can add, you can uh, assign to a sound to um, to uh, basically uh, uh, be distance in the game. So if you set a numerical value of 5,000 to the explosion, that means if 5,000 meters in the 3D world that you're in, that you're going to actually once you go 5,001 meters, you're not going to be able to hear it again. But as you approach it some more it's actually going to automatically kind of automate the volume up so you can hear it. So once you're right next to it, it's as loud as it's going to get. So I was closely supervised by my lead, Frank Patrikas, who gave me feedback on my work, and he also told me Volition's methodology for game audio implementation. He served as my primary mentor, and he just kind of, you know, he didn't help hold my hand so much, but he, he gave me a lot of feedback about what was appropriate to be in a game. And he was good for after working on several dozen visual effects sounds in a month, I was given the opportunity to uh, design the sound of actually a, a very important weapon in the game. And this weapon, um, so I'm smiling. <laughs> um, this basically, it's like, okay, let me tell you how weapon sounds work first. You basically have a start sound, which is where you pull the trigger, you hear the initial blast of the weapon. And there's usually four variations of that start. And it transitions into a loop sound. So the da, 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 da is the loop. And the release is the tail. So whenever you let go of the trigger or you run out of ammo, you hear the release and it cuts off the loop. So for this particular sound, uh, for this particular weapon, it was actually uh, for a side mission. So it wasn't one of a main, uh, main game weapon. But the side mission, uh, if you know anything about Saints Row, it's a little over the top. So this gun was basically this big super soaker that was loaded with human fecal matter that you would shoot at everyone, and it was basically, just for lack of a better term, it was a poop gun. <laughs> and so this is like my first month in the industry, designed to pump a poop gun now. Uh, so my friend Ariel, who was, alongside, uh, who was hired alongside of me, um, we both went into the, to their uh, Volition vocal booth and we just kind of got crazy. And, you know, Ariel can make some amazing sounds with his mouth, and you know, and we were recording mud sloshes and all sorts of stuff. And uh, and unfortunately for the poop gun, it didn't actually ship. Uh, it was kind of sad because design decided to be like, well, we should actually make this a septic truck. So it actually got canned, and it never made it to the light of the world, unfortunately. But I did bring it here with me, and I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, so what you're going to hear here is just those four start variations, the loop, and then the four stop variations. So uh, also, this is like the only surviving remnant of it. I couldn't find a better quality version, so you have to excuse like the horrible quality of it. But uh, because we had to downsample everything to like 3200, so it was really kind of crappy. Here it is. <laughs> Sound right here. 
you'll throw, you'll basically add the emitter right here, and it will have a cricket sound. You will set the distance based attenuation, and wherever you are in the world, it's basically like the best analogy that I can come up with is it's like an invisible speaker that's just kind of playing a sound at a certain volume, and you can only hear it at a certain distance. So we do that all throughout the world. So here you might throw wind gusts and other things, and uh, and you can also throw these big, big square volumes. So you can draw these big square, we call them sound volumes, in Unreal, and you can whenever you walk inside these big squares, two-dimensional audio will play. Two-dimensional audio just means it's playing in both speakers, and you can hear it like you would be hearing this room and mics in here. So that's how ambience works. So working on ambience spans the entire development of a game. And we did it throughout Saints Row 2. We're doing it on Borderlands 2 right now. It's just a constant process because there's so many areas of the game that the player can go to. And two other sound designers and myself went through the Saints Row City, known as Stillwater, district by district. And we flesh out the role of environmental sound. So we're, we're going into our DAWs and we're adding we're, we're basically combining uh, effects that we have in our libraries that have either been reported on site or just in libraries that we've purchased, and we're creating unique environmental stuff. And we're trying to make it as unique as possible. Even if you do use sound libraries, and I should have mentioned this actually when I was talking about the demos, but if you're using sound libraries, don't rip sounds just verbatim. Mix sounds together, layer them together. Show that you can actually uniquely create these assets. and and create something completely new out of something that was reported by you know someone else. Even. And even if you were only just pitching things down, it at least shows that you did something, right? So um, by the time we had completed work on Sanctuary 2, we covered so many different areas of game audio. These are just the responsibilities that I covered. And we did uh, object impacts, ambience, visual effects, weapons, voice, mission-specific audio. Uh, I helped write the pause menu music, so whenever you press pause, there's actually a little beat that plays in the background. There's uh, the Volition uh, logo, title screen, and music and effects, so whenever you boot up the game, there was like a splash logo that occurs, and I did all the stuff for that. And of course, bug fixing and animations. And uh, we do a lot of Easter eggs, too. Like, uh, if you don't know what an Easter egg is, it's just like something that's hidden in the game that's meant to be kind of a joke. So, um, and it's the new Easter egg. But uh, we basically could put these Easter eggs wherever we wanted. Every single studio has a policy on the Easter eggs, so actually, they actually have it written up like, you can do this, just make sure you tell us that you, what you did so it doesn't show up online and embarrass the hell of it. Uh, <laughs> something really weird. So after finishing the work on Red Faction Real, I'm not going to talk about Red Faction Real very much, and if you have any questions about it at the end, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to answer them. But uh, the only thing really big that I did on that was uh, contribute to the musical score, actually. And I wrote mission briefing music and ambient music. Not all developers write music in-house. Music composition gigs are actually mostly freelance. So Volition was a rare case scenario where this occurred. Um, it doesn't happen in most places, and normally developers outsource the music. We have done a little bit of music composition in-house at Gearbox. I personally haven't done anything, but my good friend Race and Varner has. Uh, so that was just kind of like a little uh, a summary of working at Volition. Um, I'm going to jump straight into working at Gearbox. So during my time at Volition, I met a really great friend, and he was a fellow sound designer and co-worker who ended up moving down to Gearbox during my, uh, during my uh, employment at Volition. So for about six months, him and I worked together closely, and we became great friends. And he ended up moving down to Gearbox where Mark Kilborn, my online mentor that I mentioned earlier, was currently working. Mark ended up leaving and going to work at Raven Software, where he is actually now the audio director. So he kind of moved up in his own way. And Mark had that spot open, so it's kind of crazy how everything kind of comes full circle. I actually ended up a year later after Mark left um, taking his desk. Um, and I actually work at his desk right now. So. Um, so uh, we we totally uh, we totally connected, and uh, he ended up helping me land a new gig uh, just two years after working at Volition after I completed two projects with him. So the new Gearbox IP that they were releasing that year was Borderlands, and it was released in fall of 2009. Anybody played it here? Anybody played Borderlands? Mm -hmm. Whoa, a lot of people played it. <laughs> so shortly after I was hired at production ramp down on the main game, pre-production of these DLCs began. 
And I gotta be honest, uh, I actually have no content of my own in Borderlands. Um, I only did some <coughs> mixing for them and bug fixing because I got hired at the very end of the process and all that stuff was already done. So I couldn't really jump in there. And, and so if you hear anything, it's not me. Um, so I'll talk about the DLCs. And the first DLC was the zombie island of Dr. Ned. And um, it was a zombie reskinning of the main game. So the designers decided, hey, we've created this game. Let's add some extra levels and extra content. But let's not make it like the main game. Let's just kind of do some, let's you know, throw a fun twist on it. So um, can one of you guys click on the YouTube link there? Yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to show you like a minute of what, that, what some of this stuff was like. Um, to just give you an idea of what, what the work we had to do with the our words. If you could bump it up to the you know, it. Oh, uh, started back where I had it at a certain spot. Oh, was it? Yeah. Three minutes, like 16 seconds, roughly? Mm -hmm. What's that? Like three minutes, 16 seconds in. Roughly. Yeah. Uh, Here, wait. Do this. Oh. <laughs> Tony. Oh. Oh, God. <laughs> I like to be precise. But if you're really going to solve the zombie infestation, you're gonna need to talk to Dr. Ned. He's been trying to fix the problem, and I'm sure he could use a hand. You'll find him at his office down on the docks. I'll open the waterfront gate so you can be on your way. Let's go! Really too bad another poor adventurer is going to be zombie too. And... Oh, oh, you know the drill. So long, fearless traveler. Enjoy your stay at Jacob's Go. Good luck.
that's just a short example of some of the work that we did on that. Um, we created original theme music for it. I actually didn't do any of the music, but uh, my friend Rayson Barner, the guy that helped me get the job there, uh, did. And we added new UI sounds. And one of the most unique things that we did was we actually recorded and layered original crowd reactions of chants. So all those crowd reactions that you hear, we actually took a bunch of our focus testers that come into the studio and we put them in our uh, motion capture room and we just were like, we need you to be actors in our game. And we recorded about, there were about 30 of them, and we got them to do all these chants. So when you hear, you just heard uh, those, those people chanting Roland's name, that's actually all those focus testers that were in, in the room just get, doing those chants for us. And we would layer them on top of each other, so 30 became 60, and then 60 became 90. And it became a much bigger sound as a result. And so we have all these crowd reactions that are custom tailored to what's happening in the game. We have oohs and ahs and you know, all sorts of reactions that are customized to what you do. So if you blow someone's head off, they're gonna be like, they're gonna say certain things, I can't remember what they said, but they would say certain things that would be like, oh yeah, you know. And uh, we also recorded and implemented new dialogue. So a whole process of getting all the stuff in the game and yet another short time frame, eight weeks, this is, another quick turnaround. And that's what's rewarding about working on a DLC, is that you work two to three years on a game sometimes, and you, you don't know how the world's gonna you know, like it. But once a DLC comes out, you instantly get that gratification that the work you did is now out in the world and people can uh, check it out. So the third uh, Borderlands DLC, the Secret Armory of General Knox, followed immediately after Moxie. And this was definitely our most ambitious DLC yet. It was my first experience becoming a lead sound designer on a project. In the, in the Secret Art uh, DLC 3, we, um, we recorded new characters, we created original sound assets for the new creatures and characters. So what I mean by that is that we have new character voice, but we also have sound design assets for like this guy, for example. Um, and we had other new creatures that we, we did sound design passes for. And we supported audio for three new vehicles. And also, there was a lot more localization work that I had to do in, in this particular one for all the different languages. So we also had mission-specific audio support for over six, six hours of new gameplay. Um, so we spent about 12 weeks uh, uh, on, on, all these, on all these new sounds. And it, it, it required a lot of content from all the different departments of Gearbox. So working in the game industry, you're just working with a bunch of different people who do something very similar to you. And in fact, they, I do sound, but someone else does animation. Someone else does art. Someone else uh, does design. And everyone else is just like you. We're just trying to create a cohesive product. So we spent about 12 weeks on that, and it ended up being our most popular DLC. So I wanted to show also like a, kind of an example of what sometimes a voice task can be like. Um, not a lot of people think, you know, a, a lot of creative uh, stuff can go into uh, actually working with the boys, but there's actually can be some more creative opportunities than you might think. So this first thing I'm going I'm to show you is um, actually just an unprocessed vocal file of, of something that occurs in the game. So this, basically, what happens is we have what's known as an echo communication in Borderlands. An echo communication is a radio transmission that you receive while you're playing the game from a character in the game telling you that we need you to do this or we need you to do that whenever, you're, uh, whenever you receive a quest. So whenever uh, these echo communications occur, we actually need to put some processing on them to make it sound like, um, make it sound like it's a, a radio communication. And in this particular one, it's one of the more unique ones we had. We actually had, uh, we, we had this echo communication that sounded like a commercial. And it was a commercial for a male enhancement product. And in this, this commercial, it gets interrupted by another character in the game. And her name is Athena. And she is interrupting the signal because it's the only way she can get to you through this male enhancement product. And she has to tell you how to get to your, to your mission objective. So this is, the, uh, this is the original spokesperson, unprocessed line. For, for that, uh, for that, um... Do you ever feel like you are just firing blanks? Do the ladies in your life find your gun a little short on...